Are we already halfway there? Thank goodness. Welcome back to Feta, the Emblem of Justice. In Chapter 7, the Liberation Army's next objective is to invade the largest city on the peninsula and take control of its resources, including large stocks of weapons and other supplies. So yeah, generic military operations. To be quite honest, this chapter feels like one big giant filler chapter, though we are introduced to two of the other Commodores towards the end. This chapter also has a few annoying facets to it, which I will get into after the first battle. Now, I haven't been complaining about the fact that you can't choose where units begin each battle because it hasn't mattered a whole lot up until now. Well, this battle scatters your units around the map, and that's not good at all because it can mean slow units won't even reach the enemy, as they tend to head up to the left side of the cliff to attack Brian and McDougal. You don't even have a chance to change party members, and that's the only real way to shift the positions of units. Anyways, this battle just requires you to take out the two mage enemies, so I suppose once they're lured in you can take them out with ease, and if you need healing, you should have someone with that full map healing spell anyways. Thing is though, this is the only battle in the entire chapter that has an objective other than kill all the enemies. That's right, all six of the remaining maps require you to kill every last one of them. It's so unreal. This is a game that tries to make us win fights without killing too many enemies, and we have six battles ahead of us where the objective is to kill them all. If you are playing a Chaos game, this could actually cause your rank to go up too high and make the Chaos characters leave the party unless you actively take steps to maintain your Chaos Emblem. There's a way to do that, actually, but we'll get to that in a little bit. It's just, this chapter having only one non-route map is really making my head spin a little bit. Right then, we have a choice of three enemy bases to take over. We have to get to them all eventually, so we'll start in the north and work our way south. The northern base is guarded by some flyers, some more centaurs, and a bunch of cannon fodder. Yeah, there's really not a lot to say here. Eventually I'm going to run out of stuff to say in these fights, although I did make one cool thing happen in this battle. A bunch of enemies got clogged together in one little area, and Cannoli and Stinger combined their firepower to do this. That's right, a quadra kill. The only reason it wasn't a pentakill was because the healer didn't get hit by Cannoli's ice magic. Healer enemies are immune to all magic attacks, if I remember right. After this battle, you can enter the fort to meet a ninja monster thing named Toby Kage, who will join the party as he's aiming to get revenge on one of the four Commodores who killed his master. We'll definitely have to bring him into that fight when it happens, I suppose. Toby Kage looks tricky to use based on what I've seen from him. He has very high movement and a combat art with splash damage like Arby and Dan had, but what's incredibly annoying is how frail he is. His HP is below 30 when he joins, the lowest out of anyone besides Eris. Physical attacks will nail him fast, though he can resist some magic. I suppose since he's a ninja you have to stick and move, and he can at least use his combat art two times before needing a mind repair. I just wish I knew what he's even supposed to be. Off to the Western Fort. It's yet another battle with a clump of enemies on an overly large, wide open space that I think I'll spare you the sight of, considering that it's more of the same tactics with nothing of interest to really... Are you kidding me? The enemy inflicted the exact amount of damage needed to off one of my guys. Wow. Well, now you see what's annoying about the mages from here on out. We'll get to Shane later. For now, after the battle, you can actually go in the fort and raid the supplies inside, but it really annoys me what they did here. You can check the boxes for items, but there is no indication of where the items are. They're all invisible, or at least you can't be certain what contains an item, and nothing indicates you've already taken an item from there. There are only three areas where you can find items like this anyways, unless they're scattered throughout towns and I haven't found them because they're all invisible, of course. Anyways, this fort has five generic healing items, which are sort of helpful. Right, so here's what it looks like whenever you go on a rescue mission to get your lost characters back. The same generic map with three useless enemies, no matter how far in the game you are. Be sure to put the lost party member back in the party before heading out to the next battle. Now then, on to the last of the three forts. What a surprise this is, it's another wide open and generic battle with lots of enemies clumped together. At least we aren't miles away from the other side at the start. 
Since it's wide open, you need to be especially wary of leaving a weak unit exposed this time around. But I'm feeling lucky and decide to employ a fun tactic I just came up with. Draw a bunch of enemies towards Stinger and Cannoli, but don't have them take their turns until almost everyone else has. Have Stinger and Cannoli fire their combat arts at a big enemy group, then use mine repairs to give them their MP back. When everyone's refreshed on the next turn, you can immediately fire their combat arts AGAIN, and this should be enough to blast a huge chunk of enemies clean off the map. Look at this! A PENTAKILL! Of course, this does mean you miss out on some EXP because you can only collect a max of 99 EXP per battle, but I don't care. Pulling this off felt awesome and made me really appreciate the gameplay a little... more. Oh, not again! How does a flying unit even get hit by Gaia magic anyways? It's not even Tobikage causing this, he actually resists that spell. Anyways, after you clean out the fortress, you can raid the armory for more weapons. Sadly, not one of the weapons in this pile are any better than what you can get by this point, and they sell for chump change, so that's unfortunate. What you actually want is the secret item in the very back of the fort, and how you're supposed to know it's there is beyond me. It is called the Chaos Edge, and though other swords found later are more powerful, the Chaos Edge is the only ranged sword in the game, and has a chance to instantly KO undead enemies. I give it to Toby Kage because he has the highest movement out of my sword users and he could use the extra edge. Moving on to the forest, we get a telepathic message from Flair, the second of the four Commodores. Flair has a lot of magic at her disposal, including illusions, necromancy, and presumably fire magic. Strange that she doesn't just torch the entire forest and take us with it, instead she traps us inside and raises a bunch of zombies to kill us slowly. An enemy appears on the map, but don't go for it quite yet, instead visit the other part of the map first. It's there that we meet yet another character, a wolf named Shelly, who happens to be McDougal's ex-girlfriend. Well gee, isn't that a coincidence? What is Shelly doing here? Apparently she's sabotaging the Empire in various ways, but the Liberation Army never mentioned her, and isn't it kind of awkward that they were dating while McDougal was in the Empire, but have now met up after he deserted? Was Shelly also in the Empire Army? What drove her to desert if so? Anyways, she only joins on Chaos playthroughs, which might make sense, but she never gives any real reason for it, she just kinda leaves. I don't get any of these guys! Shelly's even more strange on the battlefield, and I don't mean because she wears even less clothing than Dora. Shelly has a combat art, but because she never has more than zero MP, she'll never be able to use it. The reason for this is that the developers wanted to give her a combat art, but didn't finish implementing it in time. Though if you hack Shelly's MP so she can use it, the animation's glitched, but it otherwise functions fine. Actually, every character was supposed to have a combat art, and in the Saturn remake of this game, they all do, but I dunno, I don't think it would be balanced if every character had a combat art. Anyways, as she is in this version, Shelly's pretty much McDougal without the combat art. Now, where were we? Right, enemies. Flair conjures up a gang of undead monsters to fight you. This fight is as boring as any of the others, just cut through whatever gets in your way. The flyers are the hardest part, so be careful around them. The zombies are nothing but giant HP sponges, and the skeletons die in one hit, but are strong offensively. Eris can use the Turn Undead spell to eliminate up to five zombies in one shot, though with her low movement she rarely gets the chance. Either way, this fight really isn't much of a challenge. I... Oh, come on! <sighs> Anyways, you can actually repeat this battle as many times as you want, since you're supposed to find something on the map and will have to repeat the battle if you leave the area first. Every repeat of the battle is going to count against your rank, which is how you can fix your rank if you're doing a Chaos playthrough. To get out of the forest, search around the trees that are shaded slightly different from the rest of the forest. Easy pickings. So remind me why Flare even made it possible to escape? You'd think they would want to trap their enemies permanently, the forest trap was actually rather effective. So we escape the woods and can move towards the city. There's another enemy group, but it actually moves away from the town, so you can slip by easily. There's little of interest in the town proper besides the shop, which, in addition to equipment upgrades, is the first to sell the best healing item in the game, the Patrol Pack. This item heals all HP and can be used on anyone within three tiles, and it costs a handful of pennies to purchase. Stock up on that and mind repairs and sell off those rations and food packs, they aren't the best item anymore. <laughs>
When you're ready, head deeper into the town. There's a vanguard of robots guarding the way in, so you know what to do, smash them all to pieces. Or you can shock them to death, because they take little damage from elements other than thunder, which isn't resisted at all. This fight is really, really easy. You just have to be careful with the turrets in the back, because they have a way bigger range than you'd expect. Shock them all to death? Wait, do robots die? Uh... Shock them all to destruction, and then move on to the last battle of the chapter. The palace is yet another indoor battle with a map that's way too big. What I like to do here is send all my units up the left side where there's a choke point you can place Brian on to draw the enemies in, then you can use Cannoli or Stinger to blast them all at once once they're in a giant clump. You don't even need to worry about leaving a weak unit exposed. When the enemy has a unit at low health, the AI will prioritize trying to heal that unit above all else and waste turns, and they're attracted to Brian like a magnet again. This fight might take a while, but as long as you don't overextend, this is really not the hardest battle in the game. With that, the entire city is now under the Liberation Army's control, and we can confront the guy in charge of the operation, Luke of the Four Commodores, who as it turns out is Lois's father. This is tempting me to make a Star Wars joke, but unfortunately Luke Skywalker here isn't going to take any of my bad puns and sneak attacks Brian with his deadly dangerous combat art that, uh, inflicts 10 points of damage, which is apparently enough to knock out Brian? What the heck? Brian, you can take a better beating than that! It's not even a sixth of its health! Ah, These scripted fights. Well, Luke decides to let us live so Lois has a chance to rejoin his side. You're gonna regret this, you know, letting the hero live never works out. With Brian out of commission for now, though, it looks like we'll be fighting the next few battles without him. Can the Liberation Army keep up its pace without its strongest man? Well, duh, but we better keep trying our best anyways.